guest of honor, Sister Desiree. I want to tell you what sister don't mind y'all knowing. Let me, let's get into sister's business for a minute. <laughs> she, she, sister says she don't mind y'all knowing that she is Sister Desiree Ann Marie Finley and that she is a member of the congregation of the Sisters of St. Felix. This congregation is also known as the Felician Sisters. They are a Franciscan community. And if we asked Sister about uh, her private life before she entered the convent, she doesn't mind you knowing that she was Desiree, who was a, uh, a dancer. She um, loved sports and basketball. She attended the University of New Mexico. And uh, during that time, she even went on a 100-mile pilgrimage by foot. So she's a sister who loves the Lord and all of creation. Because if you can walk 100 miles and do that pilgrimage by foot, and that's where she first met the Felician sisters. Um, after completing, completing her bachelor's degree in secondary education, uh, sister chose to take religious life and her calling uh, into her complete self, and she began her formation as a Felician sister. And after her formation was complete, she moved to Southern California, where she taught theology, Spanish, and dance. But you didn't know nuns were allowed to teach dance, um, or nuns could dance. Sister Desiree now lives in Western Pennsylvania, and she works closely with young folks um, and young adults. She is the vocation director and the poster child for her community. Sister has done much traveling uh, from places to Canada, Haiti, Panama, Italy, and Poland for Youth Day. Uh, she loves to participate in retreats and any outreach that her community uh, supports her and that she endeavors to move forward in her ministry. She has also had the opportunity to publish some written material, so she's a published author. She's a celebrity by anybody's definition because she's been on the Tamara Hall show. Now, don't y'all make fun of me today in my t-shirt and my uh, background. I'm not Tamara Hall. Uh, but we have a celebrity among us who was recorded uh, by American Magazine with an interview that they did with her. She is blessed to be a member of her community with final vows, which is the most precious gift to us as religious. Vows come first and foremost in our religious life. And she looks forward to her continued adventures for God's sake and God's children. That's Sister Desiree's business that she doesn't mind y'all knowing. Now, Sister, let's get into some specifics and some details about your business. Tell us about the business of the Felician Sisters. Sure. Well, thank you for that introduction. You just like brought my bio to life. I, I wish everyone was able to do that with it. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but yes, so the Felician Sisters started in Poland and um, sort of began with a woman who was taking care of widows and orphans, and she didn't really intend to start a religious community. But when other women saw what she was doing, they started to join her and her spiritual director, who was a Capuchin friar, it's a type of Franciscan. Um, he said, you know, why don't you make this official and become a community? And we got our name because the women were visiting every morning they'd take the kids and they would visit the statue of St. Felix because he was, the, he was the first Capuchin saint. So they would go to visit the statue and the people of the town would see them and they started calling them the Sisters of St. Felix. So that's our official title and then we just kind of shorten it to Felician Sisters. But that's how we got started in Poland. And then as Polish immigrants came to the United States, then a lot of priests who were also from Poland were inviting the sisters here to say, you know, we don't have a lot of people who speak Polish here. We need some people to minister to the immigrant population. And so invited our sisters and five of them came to a little town in Wisconsin. And from there, 
thousands joined us and now we're about uh, almost 500 in the United States and a little over a thousand worldwide at the moment. So, um, but uh, while we started out in education specifically teaching the immigrant children from Poland, then it went into uh, nursing. So we were both in hospitals and in education and then it just kind of blossomed and we said, you know, God can call a sister anywhere. And so our sisters do all sorts of things. We have sisters who are hospital chaplains, um, sisters who are social workers, sisters who start food pantries and run those food pantries. So we kind of do whatever the Lord asks every person. So recognizing each individual has their own calling within the community as well. Now, sister, he, take us to that point where you on this pilgrimage, walking these hundred miles, you're an athletic college student, you're a dancer, you, you are not what religious life that most of us see and understand. And here you are on this road and you encounter a police and sister and you like, okay, I need to know more. What, what, what drew you to this need to know more about a police and sister while you an athlete and a dancer and in college? <laughs> Great question. So um, I grew up going to public school, was never taught by sisters, never really saw any sisters or nuns. But when I would go to catechism classes, you know, we would read about the saints and a lot of them were sisters and nuns. And I think it was through that, even just as a child, I thought that sounds really amazing. So many of them are saints. They just have to be doing something really good. And it, it intrigued me, but it never went far beyond, I think that's cool, you know? And then uh, maybe in high school, yeah, high school, I went on a youth group trip and we were putting up the stations of the cross in a yard for a, a group of cloistered sisters. And only one nun was allowed to talk to our group. She was the extern, so you know she greeted visitors and spoke with us. And I just remember feeling like starstruck. I was like, oh my gosh, it's a nun, it's a real one. And I, I just couldn't handle it. And uh, she spoke with me and my mom for a little bit, but I, I hardly said anything. Mostly my mom spoke to her. And I saw her a couple years later at the shoe store where I work, and she remembered me and remembered talking to my mom, remembered talking about me going to make my confirmation. And I thought she has to have a deep, deep relationship with God to be able to remember somebody who hardly spoke two words to her, you know. And that was the first moment that I really thought, you know, religious life has something, something deeper than what I've experienced. Maybe that's what I want. So that was maybe like a, while I was in college, which is when I went on the pilgrimage. That's when I met these two Felician sisters who were complete opposites. So one was this Southern Californian, full of life, singing songs, just loud, playing her guitar all the time. And the other one was this very gentle introvert from Texas who could tell me all about, you know, the plants on the side of the road because she was just so knowledgeable. And I thought, I really like that in this community, you don't have to be like anybody else. You can be yourself. And that was when I said, I need to know more. Like, what, what are they doing? You know, because I see their joy and I see their unique humanness and I want, I want to be a part of that. Uh, so then I said, hey, can I visit? And I'm pretty sure at that moment, they're like, we got one. Because <laughs> they said, definitely. And then I just started spending more time with them. Now, sister, considering the fact that you said y'all originated in Poland and you, you mm -hmm. have American-based uh, convents of women, what's the age range that these Felician sisters will entertain a potential vocation? Well, as long as the woman is at least 18 years of age. So even though we will take women at 18, we do recommend that if a woman's just coming out of high school, she goes either to college for a couple of years or maybe works for a couple of years just so she can grow in her independence um, and you know, be able to grow in her responsibilities. It's not necessarily like we don't take women at 18, it's just we want to, you know, to get a little life experience. Um, and then we don't really have an age limit, but we just look at like the life experiences of a woman, let's say she's a little older, um, what she's been a part of, 
why her commitments maybe didn't last or why she never made any other commitments or you know things like that so on an individual basis look at her health and and those sort of things sister i heard <laughs> tamara hall say it's not father gerard i don't want to be too personal but Tamara Hall on that TV interview mm -hmm. got really personal with you all up in your business. Yes. And you told Tamara <laughs> Hall that you was engaged at some point during your formation. Did I understand that correctly? I was not engaged, but I was dating a guy just before, pretty much just before I entered. And I did consider him as like, if I was going to get married, I was pretty much wanting to follow that path with this, this guy in particular. Um, but while I was, so I was spending time with the sisters while I was dating him, <laughs> it's kind of like dating two different, but, um, he knew, and he knew I was visiting with the sisters, but I don't think he ever thought, oh yeah, my girlfriend's going to enter the convent. You know, he was just like, oh, she was spending time with some nuns. That's nice. Uh, but the more I spent time with the sisters, the more it felt like I was at peace. And I realized that I had been like there are a lot of flags with this guy that it just, it wasn't helping me grow. It wasn't helping him grow our relationship. And I just thought maybe this isn't for me. And I, I dated other guys. I dated a really good guy, you know, just while I was in college, but it just never seemed, it was like a shoe that I was trying to make fit. You know, I really liked it and I wanted to make it fit. But then when I started spending time with the sisters, it was like a shoe I really liked and it just seemed to fit like their way of living and their way of being it just spoke to me more than like this possible relationship spoke to me. My sister, you talking about relationships. What in your your specific ministry as vocation director and your extended ministry as a sister in your community, how many relationships do you have or how many sisters do you have in your convent where you live? There are just two of us. So this is the, I've only lived with like in, or mostly lived in what we call local convents. So those are convents mostly in neighborhoods, maybe near a parish, but with smaller groups of us because it's, it's not a large like institutional convent. Um, but the most I've lived with in a convent like that is seven. And that was in California. Um, I've also lived with five. And then here there were three of us and then one sister went to a retreat center. So now it's just the two of us, but it works out because she and I are both on the vocation team. So I do the initial pieces, like when somebody wants to know more about us, when somebody wants somebody to come and speak to their youth group or their, their um, theology classes, I do things like that. Or I go to events like NCYC or World Youth Day. And then she does the piece when someone is more serious and wants to maybe start specifically discerning with us, maybe spending time with us and praying with us, then she kind of takes them from there. So it works out because we can kind of like talk about their journey together and, and things like that. And we get along really well. We both, her mom was born in Trinidad and Tobago. My dad was born in Trinidad and Tobago. So we pretend like we're distant relatives. Um, yeah, <laughs> we have a good time. <laughs> So now I love the video that you posted of a lot of the a day in the life of where you and the sister uh, y'all shared y'all uh, divine office, the liturgy, the hours with us. Mm -hmm. um, tell us more about your prayer life with two women in a convent who have to keep the Felician uh, and Franciscan way of life. Talk to us about how that looks and how that prayer life comes to to pass. Yeah. So. It pretty much looks like a prayer life that all Felicians have, no matter if they're living with 60 or two. So we pray together twice a day. So we start our day together in prayer with morning prayer. And then of course, before COVID, we would go out for a mass and um, that we, we would usually do that together. So morning prayers and then mass together afterwards. And then because most sisters have different ministries, then from there we go out to where we need to be um, so I'll maybe go to the office or I'll go speak with a school or, you know, something like that. And then the sister I live with is a spiritual director. So maybe she would be meeting with directees or she'd be working on a retreat she's going to lead. And then we come together in the evening for evening prayer. 
So we kind of try to open and close our day with prayer and together. But somewhere in there could be during the day, could be in the evening, could be before morning prayer. Each of us is also responsible for our own prayer life. So that could include things like a rosary, Eucharistic adoration, um, spiritual reading, and those are listed in our constitution. So those are pretty much necessary. Like you can't just say, I'm not gonna do those things because I only have to do morning and evening prayer. You really are supposed to have your own personal prayer life. Um, and sometimes the rosary and adoration are done in common, depends on the convent and the schedule. Like if it's mostly retired sisters and they have time to have adoration throughout the day, or like Sister Judy and I who live together, we'll have it as part of our evening prayer. So we have 30 minutes, just quiet adoration, and then we pray evening prayer together. So, but that's most convents, it looks about like that. Yeah. Now, I had the opportunity to be a chaplain to the Felician Sisters in Philadelphia at St. Ignatius Nursing Home. Hey. So uh, is, is your charism, would you be, would you just, how would you describe your charism? Are y'all hospitalers or do you only work in nursing homes? What is the charism or, or, or the gift that is a gift to us as church from the Felician Sisters? So our, our charism is kind of long, so I wrote it down because <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> and some at some point, I think as a novice, I had it memorized because we were supposed to, but now I forget. So it specifically is this, uh, to imitate Blessed Mary Angela, who's our foundress, Blessed Mary Angela's boundless love of God, surrender to God's will, in compassionate service, total availability, and concern for the salvation of all people. So those are the five things that we're about. Love of God, surrender to God's will, compassionate service, being co completely available wherever we're needed and to whoever we're needed. So that could be anywhere. So that could be in a hospital, that could be in a prison, that could be in a neighborhood that has a bad reputation, like the neighborhood I live in. You know, it could be at an after school program. It's, and that, that was where I think the sisters decided there's freedom in what ministry you do because you could do any of those in any sort of ministry, you know, and without discrimination. So one of my favorite stories about Blessed Angela comes from a time in Poland when the Russian army was trying to take over Poland. So poor Poland was always like, someone was always trying to take over them. So, um, the Russian and Polish soldiers, when they would end up wounded and, you know, on the battlefield, Blessed Angela told the sisters, when you go out and care for the wounded, you care for everybody. I don't want you just picking up the Polish soldiers and taking care of only the Polish. You're going to take care of everybody. And because of that, when, so religious orders were suppressed for a while underneath Russian rule. And then when they were allowed to come back into existence, ours was not because of that because we were considered revolutionaries for taking care of the enemy. And so they said, no, we're not, we're not letting the Felicians come back because they were taking care of Russian soldiers. So I love it because she was so concerned for everybody that she risked, you know, not even being able to be, but eventually, of course, they were allowed to come back and the people were very happy. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. If, if somebody like St. Benedict the African wanted to develop a relationship with a Felician sister or two Felician sisters, and and we got COVID-19 going on, we got distance, you have a shortage of women in your community, I'm sure. How, how what, what is some creative, unique idea that Sister Desiree may have in her head to say, this is how we can develop a relationship despite COVID-19, despite that we don't have enough sisters to go around, despite I'm in Philadelphia and St. Benedict is in Chicago. Do you have a, do you have any ideas how we can develop, or maybe you've done this before, develop relationships with people in parishes that are distant from you? Um, what do you what, what's your thoughts, sister? Yeah, so I've never done that before because I just would travel to wherever I was being invited. Um, so now, because there's going to be that, restriction, and I'm sure even when things open up, people are going to be really cautious, you know, they're not going to want to bring somebody from across the country to speak to 100 people. So, um, 
a, a thought that I have because we have what's called an associate program, which a lot of religious communities do, or maybe it's called affiliates, something where anybody, lay people, men, women, single, married, can sort of partner with us either in ministry, but specifically in spirituality, um, in that Franciscan spirituality and in the charism of Blessed Angela, you know, being available and being, um, you know, surrendering to God's will and, and loving God and others. So my idea, like, and I don't even know how, because I'm not in charge of the associate program or anything like that, but I think it would be really neat to have like an online associate program where associates from all over the country could get together and have not necessarily classes online, but delve into that Franciscan spirituality and talk about Blessed Angela and, and things that she went through and how we, you know, maybe go through things that are similar or talk about, you know, the different saints related with our community, St. Francis, St. Clair, St. Felix. Um, I think that would be really, really nice. I have a question. You mentioned earlier that you speak at schools. Have you noticed even before the outbreak, have you been able to, uh, with your sisterhood, include others to the sister life? Uh, have you noticed that? Have you been able to get others into your, your sisterhood with what you do when you go around with your travels and you speaking at schools? Yeah, it's, uh, thank you, Claire, for that question. So that's part of having a vocation team. It's nice that we can talk about how effective it is, you know, and I've only been in this ministry, I think this is going on three years now. So to look at, you know, how many women then contact us after I go and speak at those schools or how many women contact us after I go to an event like NCYC, you know, um, and then to also think about the fact that while we would like women to join us, we also want to simply encourage women in their own journeys, whatever it is. So recently um, for, NC no, it wasn't NCYC. It was a different, it was a conference similar to that, but for young adults. And typically only sisters go and we are the ones who host a table. But this time the sister that normally would have gone with me, she couldn't. And so I said, well, because this is normally how we do it, let's try something else. And so instead, I brought two young women to host with me. And they were able to go to the conferences and things when we had breaks. And they just kept saying, thank you so much, sister, for this opportunity. I learned so much. And just for them to grow in their own Catholic faith, really, that's what we want, whether they end up joining us or not. Um, or maybe they'll tell other women about us, and those women will maybe join us. But, you know, to focus mostly on helping people and their spirituality, whether they become religious or not, that's that's what we're here for. But we do have you know, nice, a steady flow of women coming at least one a year, which is pretty good when, you know, a lot of congregations haven't had anybody for several years. Um, and they're younger. So one of the, our postulants right now is younger than me. She's in her 20s. And then we have a woman who's a candidate. Um, she's just in her sophomore year of college. So looking at joining us when she graduates. So it's, you know, it's nice to see that we have that steady flow, but it's also nice to, to not always focus on that too. And thank you. yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sister, I'm just curious because you're so young, what was your parents' reaction when you told them that you wanted to become a nun? Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's a great question. So my mom was, very excited because she's like super Catholic. And then my dad was like, mm, are you sure? You know, is that something you really, is your mom making you do that? He asked me <laughs> if that was, it was her choice. And I said, no, this is really something I want to explore. I feel, I feel called to this. And the more he saw how happy I was and, and he got to meet the sisters and see that they were like a nice, healthy community. Um, then he, he was like, okay, I can see, you know, this is a good fit. Um, and, but even all along my journey, he said, even if you leave, I'll be proud of you for trying. And if you stay, I'll be proud of you for staying. So he was, he was supportive all the way around. And my mom was always like, don't leave. But <laughs> I know she would, she wouldn't have disowned me if I left. <laughs> sister, what's the oldest that you've heard one of your sisters come into your community? What's the oldest age? 
In in recent times, uh, fifty two. But that's 52. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's young because I'm, I'm fifty two. So that's great. All you fifty two and, <laughs> and above, y'all got a place to go. The Felicia sisters are taking <laughs> applications. I had a question. Um, yeah. You talk. I I feel like I saw somewhere you talked about um your decision to go from wearing a habit to not and how your natural hair was important to you um and since the communities you live in are pretty small um can you talk about whether you had any challenges i've had friends that have gone through formation in community and um, it's been challenging being one of only a few black people and so can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yeah, that's, I like that question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think what helps is that I felt from the beginning, like when I met those two sisters um, who were so opposite, and I noticed, like, you don't have to be like anybody else. And I didn't know that was necessarily a part of who the Felician sisters were until I was on the inside, you know, and, and really living this. But to see that even in the variation of what we wear. So in my community, it's a little bit different because in some communities, everybody wears a habit. In other communities, nobody wears a habit. But as a Felician sister, so we have like certain colors we can wear. So browns, beige, um, white, black. And we can choose to wear a more traditional habit with a veil, maybe a blouse and a skirt in those color schemes with or without a veil, maybe a dress those color schemes with or without a veil. So even that says, I get to choose how I'm going to represent myself as a Felician. Um, and when I first entered, I didn't really give thought to what I was going to wear. Um, I just met the sisters and ironically, the sisters I knew in, in New Mexico, uh, the Felician sisters, almost nobody wore a habit, but I didn't even notice that. I just thought, oh, I like these sisters. And when I became a novice was when we were given the, the option, you know, are you going to wear a habit or not? And since I never thought of it, I said, oh, oh yeah, sisters wear habits, so I'm going to wear that. Um, and I wore it for about five years. And then the more I got to uh, understand my role as a woman, as a religious, as myself, I was like, okay, this doesn't feel authentic for me. This doesn't feel like how I, I'm called to represent myself for the Felician sisters. And, um, and part of that was my identity as a black woman with very curly, big hair, <laughs> you know? And I thought, well, that's, I, I have to let that also be, be out there. And so, you know, with a veil, I had like little curls sticking out here and there, but I, I really wanted to like fully own my color and my femininity. And I felt like both of those, I couldn't share in the way I, I dressed. and. So because I had the freedom to change what I wore, I just kind of stopped wearing a veil and, and started wearing other things. And the sisters I lived with, they didn't really say anything. They just kind of were like, oh yeah, that's fine. And then one day they said, we're just curious, you know, like what, and some, one, only one wore it in our house and the rest didn't even wear a habit. So they said like, what made you switch over? And so I shared my thoughts and they were like, yeah, that's great. You know, we're, we're glad you took some time to think and pray about it. And, and that was it. <laughs> so. Um, even though I have like two black women in our community right now, it's myself and a sister from Kenya who transferred from a different community. So the two of us in the United States are the only black sisters. Um, I don't feel, I don't feel singled out. Actually, I feel like my community wants to hear me because they, they're like, we don't have a lot of sisters who look like you. So we, we want to know what you think about certain things that we, we don't really understand or, you know, like, because I'm on the vocation team, you know, I help with putting out flyers and different images and things. And um, so they ask for my opinion on those things. And I have lots of opinions. <laughs> so one flyer had three different pictures. And two of those pictures were white people helping people of color. And I was like, no. So <laughs> I said, maybe you can keep one of those, but you need to change the other one to reverse it. You need a black person helping some white people, you know, and, or a variety of people, something that speaks differently about people of color. And so they said, okay. So we looked for, for an image and they said, do you like this one? Do you approve? I said, yeah, that's better. Um, 
you know, so they, they look for my viewpoint because they know that they don't see with the same lens. So I actually feel like it um, gives me an opportunity to use my voice more instead of um, less because I am kind of a rarity in my religious community. I have a question. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about your um, kind of upbringing and with your faith? I know you touched a little bit about it, but I'm more curious uh, for my own child. Like, like, what was that kind of, um, well, I guess my say Catholicism you grew up with? Like, do you go um, to Mass every Sunday? Like, do you do as a family, like, uh, you know, devotions, whatever? So just, can you just speak to that and how that built? or laid a foundation for um, you kind of having this um, uh, vocation? Thank you. Um, yeah, I was baptized Catholic as an infant and my mom was mostly the strong Catholic in my family. So uh, I think my mass or my dad would sometimes come to mass and he joined the choir for a little while, but mostly it was my mom taking us. We went every Sunday. We didn't go, that I recall, during the week, but at home we had devotionals. We had, like, we would pray the rosary together, which as a child I was like, ah, oh, this is so boring, <laughs> but, you know, it laid the foundation for, like, loving that later on, and, and my, my love for Mary came from, from that daily devotion, um, and having novenas. Even now, my mom calls me. She's like, don't forget, Pentecost is coming up. You got to say the novena to the Holy Spirit, so... <laughs> I'm the sister, but she, my mom is still reminding me, which is good. I need it. Um, so I, it was just like, and we had Catholic symbols everywhere. I remember a friend coming, I think she was Jewish. And so I had like a birthday party or something. And she said, I've never seen so many religious symbols outside of my house. You know, she's like, I go to other friends' houses and they're Christian or whatever. And she's like, but I love that you really have these symbols everywhere. And I didn't even think about it. It was just... I was doing what my mom had done, you know, and this was when I was living on my own at all these Catholic symbols everywhere. So it was, it was at home that it was really instilled and then going to catechism on a regular basis and, and having it reinforced there, um, you know, and, and being able to be involved as a high school student in my youth group and going for service projects. Cause that also showed me how much I loved serving others and just, and being and doing for others um, in ways that I didn't know before. And so drawing, drawing me into a life of service and not just like a moment or two of it, you know, but really wanting to live that connection. And same with the pilgrimage I went on. I didn't even know it was a religious, like I didn't know we were praying for vocations. <laughs> I just thought, oh, it sounds nice. You know, we're going to walk through some nice historic towns and things and some cool churches. And then it ended up the specific intention was to pray for vocations. And I was like, what? So, you know, but to, to be plugged into certain things that are part of my Catholic faith. That's what got me here, really, without me always being conscious of that. Okay, sister, here, here's, here's the hard question for you. <laughs> tell, tell us a challenge. All of this sounds beautiful and fluffy. I only have been in religious life for only 15 years. I've only been a priest for four years, and I've had some challenges that bless me and certainly has made me a better religious. And I hope it makes me a better priest every day, but give us the hard stuff. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You're right. Cause not everything's fluffy, <laughs> but um, I think hmm, one of the hardest things for me has been moving a lot. So I, as a child, we didn't really, we just lived in New Mexico most of my life. Um, I was born, actually I was born in Biloxi, Mississippi, which I discovered is only a few hours from where Thea Bowman was born. And so that makes me very happy. <laughs> um, but then my mom's family is from New Mexico. So uh, we lived there since I was, I think in kindergarten. So I really, um, yeah, I really, I grew up there. But I think having that stability and not really moving a lot, like it, it, I wasn't used to then when I entered religious life and okay, it's been a couple of years, you got to go somewhere else. And I was like, what? It, it was hard to form relationships in places and then you got to get up and go. And I just, it was, that was, I think this would have been one of the hardest challenges. Uh, but that was in 
the beginning of my formation. So they wanted me to have different experiences, get to know different sisters, be a part of different ministries. Um, so now, now that I've made final vows, there's really no need for me to like up and go every few years. But now I feel like I, I want to. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I've been here a few years. It's time to go somewhere. Let's go. Let's go. Where am I moving next? You know, but maybe now the challenge is going to be to grow my roots and let myself stay somewhere for a while. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll I was just wondering if you could sort of exhort some young people on how should they be approaching vocational discernment, especially if like every door is kind of open. That's a great question. Thank you. Approaching discerning a vocation is, is like you said, important to have doors open. So to say, you know, I'm open to anything God is asking of me, whether that's married life or single life or religious life. Um, but really to start with like, what are the desires of my heart? So a lot of women who come and speak with me are like, well, I really want to get married, but I also feel drawn to this life. So to ask yourself, what is it about, like wh whether you feel drawn to something or not, what is it about that life? So what is it about married life? I ask them, is it that you really, really want? And so if it's, you know, to have a family and to, to care for people, then I ask, is that possible in another vocation? And so if there are things that kind of get interspersed and you can have a sort of a family and care for people as a religious and even as a consecrated single. So, you know, what are the elements specific to a married vocation that you can't find in a religious vocation and, and vice versa, same with single life. Um, but to sit with the, those questions and to, again, say, why am I drawn there? And, and what is it that God might be inviting me to? And to look at like the breadcrumbs. So kind of like I was saying with my vocation, where I plugged into different things and I didn't necessarily realize it was leading me to those, like this place. But as I look back, I say, oh yeah, that's, you know, signing up for that pilgrimage, even though I had no idea it had to do with vocations, that's where I met the sisters, but it was kind of like God leading along the way. And, and knowing too, how your relationship with God works. Like I, I don't pay attention to things very well. <laughs> so I'm not detail oriented. So I needed God to be like, here, go on this vocation, but to draw me in because a friend said it would be a nice cultural experience, like that gets my attention. But then to find out later, it's for vocations and I'm going to meet some sisters. So that was God's part. God was getting me through the relationship piece of, you have a friend who does this. Um, so where does God usually get you? You know, like where, how does God usually speak to you and paying attention to that? Like, what is it? Is it the relationship piece? Is it the, you know, um, freedom to move around pieces that, you know, things like that. I don't know if that helps, but <laughs> good. I got thumbs up. 